for anyone that does know me, they'll be, um, they'll be smiling because Africa by Toto played in the break. And I know that Toto is one of my favorite bands of all time. Having just seen him in Manchester, that's made my morning. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, talking about software engineering and what it is, because I couldn't think of a way to narrow down this talk, really, because it's, it is such a broad topic. So I'll wind right back and start at the beginning with my introduction to it. About 20 years ago, uh, I was looking for places on computer science courses around the country, uh, and I got offered a place at Brunel, um, and I was duly invited down for an interview. Um, I was really excited. It was my first proper time away from home, as it is for most people. Uh, and I went down with, uh, with bright eyes, wanting to learn more about computer science and how I was going to have my mind blown at uni. Now, actually, what happened when I got there was I met probably the least enthusiastic, most, um, uh, I don't know, least positive human I've ever met. Um, and this professor, he was sat there really suddenly like, oh, I can't believe I've got to talk to you. Um, he said, what do I want to do computer science for? And I said, I want to write software for people to use. And he looked at me and he just gruffly replied, you don't want to write software, it's just maintenance. It's nothing original, it's just, it's just rubbish. So I said, well, sell it to me. That's, uh, what a positive outlook. So I thought about this, and what, what might be affecting this guy's mood is that Brunel is actually the setting for Kubrick's film, A Clockwork Orange, which isn't particularly known for its positivity and, and, and uplifting outlook. Or perhaps it was perhaps his, his poorly expressed weariness with how young people, such as myself at the time, are deluded into thinking that professional software development was just about coding. I mean, it's all artisan and crafty, right? Um, but clearly, I think that 20 years later, is, it's, it's obvious to me now that there's a lot more that goes into this profession than meets the eye. So I wanted to start by looking at what do we actually mean by software engineering. Now I'm going to reference this book a bit. And actually, I, I found it on my shelf. And so I do actually own a copy of this, believe it or not. Uh, you'll be remarked at how pristine it is, and that might give you some indication of how much studying I did at uni. Um, <coughs> but it starts off, and it's a pretty good description. So an engineering discipline that is concerned with all aspects of software production. Great, OK, so that's pretty, pretty broad. Um, and it's about production. Going to the, the source of all knowledge modern, in modern world, Wikipedia, they're a little bit more... Um, specific. It's the application of engineering, the first mention of this sort of idea of engineering, to the development of software in a systematic method. Now, I quite like this because the systematic bit is really important. Going a bit further, the IEEE are really much more uh, de defined, saying it's systematic, disciplined, quantifiable, and it involves the development, operation, and maintenance of software. Now, this is really important for me because the operation and maintenance bits of this are the first time I've actually ever seen a definition that, that mentions something other than just writing stuff and handing it over. Now, this was in 1990, and actually, um, about 20 years later, they sort of went back on it and said, actually, it's nothing to do with operations and maintenance, and they focus more on documentation. Um, asking around the office, uh, one of our um, <laughs> software engineer colleagues, Tom, uh, he offered me this, this natty bit of insight, which says that basically it's such a vague and unhelpful term, why bother using it? Um, other people said it's designing, writing, and testing computer applications. Uh, and one of our engineering managers said, this is solving problems by providing robust and appropriate technical solutions. Again, we, we're sort of focusing on the delivery of something and not on the operation and running of it later on. It is really hard to summarize. Um, but I think there's a few ways that we can sum this up. Before I do that, I'm just going to talk briefly about how we often compare software engineering to other engineering disciplines. And actually, just talking before this, it's, it's obvious that actually you can't really draw any parallels, mainly because if you're some sort of engineer in a, in a physical sense, you don't get to change stuff afterwards. So if we look at this, this sort of example of architecture and civil engineering, there's a lot that goes into that. But once it's done, it's pretty much done. And as anyone that's ever walked down Neville Street when it's windy will testify, that's quite a big problem if you don't get it right. Um, so it's clear that you have to know an awful lot. So let's have a look at what those things are. So I think that software engineering is knowledge, methods, and experience, specifically scientific and technical knowledge. It's systematic and repeatable. You should be able to prove this, this method time and time again. It's disciplined and rigorous. You aren't just yahooing something into production. You have got methods that prove the correctness of what you're doing and how you actually can guarantee to people that this is actually going to work. It's quantifiable and measured, both the process in terms of uh, an agile workflow, maybe where you're using ticketing systems such as Jira to measure your output and your, and your cycle time, but also in terms of the value that your work is bringing to your customers and to the business that you work in. 
it's obviously operating in a maintained system. So I'm going to stress this quite a lot throughout the talk because I think this is one of the things that modern ways of working, including microservices architectures, really, really for forces us to think about. It's not just chucking it over the wall anymore. There aren't them and us with ops. It is everyone in it together as a team. And then lastly on my list, importantly lastly, I've put writing code. Because actually, when you look at the factors that go into a day-to-day -day, um, working role as a software engineer, that's probably the least amount of time you'll actually spend doing anything. Reading code, perhaps you might add a bit more in there. Um, and certainly, I think there's a bit of a question around modern, modern standards around documentation. But writing code, documentation, and configuration is, is a key part, but it's actually only a small part. So I just want you to think how that list might actually compare to what you do every day. We often talk at Skybet about how we're not writing enough code for this or we're not getting these features out. But actually, we're all engineering all the time. We're all constantly looking at how our systems are working, thinking about our workflow, and then designing new solutions to, to help us move our products forward. So going through this list, I'm going to talk through a few of them in detail. So knowledge and experience. It's more specifically how we gain knowledge. Now, there's an interesting quirk around software engineering, and it's actually quite a young discipline. I don't mean that in the sense of young people. I mean, it's actually just not very old at all. Um, so, but I'm going to start by looking at something that's completely unrelated. So, um, it's sort of the backdrop is it's the early 20th century. Um, a chap called Pearl, uh, Paul Ehrlich is looking for a chemical that will kill microorganisms but leave the ho host unaltered. Um, they were a so called magic bullet, uh, which we clearly all now know doesn't exist. But they were, they were looking for this magic bullet. In 1928, there was a chance happening in a laboratory in London which changed the course of history. So, does anybody know who this is? If anyone wants to shout, sorry? Fleming. It is Fleming, yes. It's Alexander Fleming. Now, he came back from holiday in 1928, and he was chatting to a colleague when he noticed that in, a, in an agar plate, there was a, a specimen of mold um, that had grown, and there was some bacteria also growing on this plate, but there was an exclusion zone around the mold. So clearly, there was some reason that this bacteria wasn't able to grow near it. He, caught, he realized that the mold was from the penicillium genus, and he tried really hard to extract it, and he named the active ingredient penicillin. He wrote this all up. This is really important. He wrote it all up, and in 1929, he published his findings. But he was unable to, to stabilize and extract penicillin in any, any decent quantity so that it could be used in clinical trials. Um, this idea of the magic bullet that had been sort of touted from the early 20th century kind of lost its way a bit after that, and people didn't really follow up. And it was only until, it was only 10 years later in 1939, when a student at Oxford University, Ernst Chain, found Fleming's paper and presented it to his, his supervisor, Howard Florey, to say, this is, there's something here, shall we have a look at it? Now, Fleming had been spending the 10 years prior to that sending out this mold to as many people as would be interested in it, hoping that someone who had more skills than him could, could actually extract it and create something that could be used in clinical trials. And Florey assembled a team and managed to do that. They, they recruited a... Um, a third person called, um, I forget his name, uh, too many notes, sorry. Norman Heatley, important, he's the fungus expert, exciting job, I'm sure that is. Um, he recruited the three of them, and they set about making this in mass quantities and extracting it so that it was stable. I think the key point about this is it was about the transfer of knowledge. Pe penicillin was found by Fleming, but it wasn't useful. And people almost forgot about it. It nearly didn't happen. This super, this super cure that went on to help us win World War II and has saved millions of lives worldwide in the, in the years since nearly didn't happen. And it was because of this publishing of the paper and the transfer of knowledge from one person to another that helped people to move forward as, as a group, as a wider um, scientific practice. Back in software engineering world, we look at things like this from the Agile Manifesto, where we favor working software over comprehensive documentation. Now, this to me feels like it's almost the antithesis of what was going on with Fleming and the scientific practices in the early 20th century. Now, what they say in the Agile Manifesto is while there is value in the things on the right, i.e. the comprehensive documentation, we want to focus more on the things on the left. And I think this is all down to a reaction to we don't want to do upfront planning and waterfall methodologies. But somewhere along the lines, we've also dropped this idea that we want to be able to document our decisions and, we've, and we need to be able to share what we've done and our context at the time we were doing it so that other people can pick up where we left off. 
back in my software engineering handbook, Somerville says that software isn't just the programs, but it's all the good documentation and configuration data which is needed to make them operate correctly. Now, I think he's probably more meaning that you need to have a massive requirements document and you need to have a handover to a client where you're going to give them how you operate this thing. But actually, as a general statement, this works really well for engineering. You do need to make sure that you are doing more than just writing the code. You're made, making sure you're documenting your decisions and the reasons behind what you're doing so that you can share that knowledge and then make progress further on. There is a catch, though, and Michael Feathers is summing this up nicely here, in that every 10 years or so, we reinvent our language and notations, effectively making our papers and, and our information out of date before anyone really discovers them. Uh, he says here that um, it's hard to find deeply technical books because they, they don't stand the test time. They're all Latin within 20 years. They're all dead language. So then let's look at this other side of it, the experience side. Now, this chap in the background um, over here is Uncle Bob. He's not known for his um, shyness and his, his um, uh, keeping his thoughts to himself. But one of the things he's quite good at doing is talking about the role of, of professionalism in the industry. And a few years ago, he published a blog post which looked at various bits of stack overflow data and how age correlated to various statistics. This one's looking at age versus reputation, where you can clearly see that the older the, the person on stack overflow, the greater their reputation on averages, ignoring some of the, the fa failings of um, averages as a, a measurement tool. And then looking forward again, he correlated the number of questions asked to the number of answers given and showed that Older programmers generally answered more questions than they asked, and quite a significant number of questions are answered by them compared to what they ask. The conclusion he draws, going back this, to this slide, is that most of the programming world is actually filled with very young people. They're all under 28. And his hypothesis is that every five years, the number of programmers in the world doubles, which, if you take that and extrapolate it out, means that the, between... 28 and 33 is the next half of all the programmers. So it's a very, very small amount of people over the age of 40 or 50 that are involved in this profession still. But they're the ones that carry the experience and the knowledge that is so useful and so effective that, um, to transfer to these newbies in the world. Now, Uncle Bob is, again, as I said, he's not particularly um, known for holding back his opinions, and he describes this as the programming um, field, as the logical equivalent of Lord of the Flies, where it's all kids and no adults. So we need to think about this in terms of how are we working and how are we enabling people with vast experience to be part of our team so that they can lead these younger, less experienced people that are going to be driving our businesses forward in the future. And an interesting little point on the end here is that he asked the questions, where did all the old programmers go? But in fact, the answer isn't that they've gone anywhere, really. They haven't quit to become managers or gone to become chicken farmers. There just weren't that many in the first place because the, the discipline is so young, there aren't many people who have been programming for 30 or 40 years. I was talking to Jason, who's on afterwards, after, before the talk. He said, you've got to ask people how many of them have got parents that worked as software engineers or in the software engineering profession. Summing this up, it means that uh, if we're not careful, most software organizations are doomed to keep making the same, same mistakes that they've made before because it's dominated as a profession by novices and it's going to exist in a state of per perpetual immaturity. So we need to think about how we can stay technical for longer, how we can avoid rushing for seniority by moving out of technical roles and, and be able to be prepared to reward people for staying in engineering disciplines for longer because they're, more, they're as valuable in some cases as directors. We take this um, as, a, as, a, as a practice at Skybet, and we try and put it into our teams as continuous development. So about 18 months ago, there was a big change um, in the way that our teams are allowed to spend money on their, their learning and development. Each person is given a, a fund so they can go and, and follow their interests, and they could go to conferences or buy hardware or books or anything like that, do courses. Uh, and in addition, they're also given Friday afternoons where they can follow uh, their interests and, and, and participate in courses or projects that might not be directly related to their day-to-day -day work, but it encourages them to, to follow this pursuit of knowledge and to gain experience that is wider than the current thing that they're working on. And this is really important because if we don't allow slack in our systems for people to be able to follow this, this knowledge and pick up things from the past, we aren't going to be able to progress forward to, to, to develop the next version of, of our world and to be the people that extract the penicillin from the mold and make it into a mass-produced 
uh, clinical drug. Systematic and repeatable is an interesting proposition, and I guess you might actually think of this as DevOps. And it's obviously a massive topic. It's been around for a while now. Um, but it still bears talking about because it's still not as widely practiced as you might think. And I'm going to start this off by talking about an example of, of a company who um, were based in America. They, they traded shares on the stock exchange called Knight Capital. Um, you won't have heard of them because they don't exist anymore. Um, oh, someone's smiling in the front right here. Yeah, it, it did all go a bit wrong, yeah. Um, so basically, what happened with Knight Capital? They, they write software that makes trades automatically. Um, and in 2012, they were just working on some new features for their software, and they followed good practice in that they used feature flags. But one of the things they hadn't done is automate their rollout process. So when they were rolling out this code with this feature flag that had been repurposed, it went on to seven of their eight servers. No big deal, I guess. But the problem is that the feature flag that was in place previously controlled something that was changing the weighting of, of stock value. And so they used it as a control mechanism for testing internally to see how their algorithms performed. When you put this into the public sphere, the, the, the output was catastrophic. They, they, they traded um, 4 million um, executions in 154 stocks in about 45 minutes, which resulted in 397 million shares being sold or bought. Um, and they took a pre-tax loss of $461 million in 45 minutes, all because they hadn't automated their rollout. It's basically because some poor technician forgot to deploy the code to the eighth server. This is frightening because it's still possible. This is 2012. This isn't like a really old story. This is, this is back when people were starting to pursue AWS as a platform and, and modern practices. One of the things that we talk about, well, so I'll go back a second. So what they should have done here is obviously release iteratively. They had the right idea with feature flags, but they weren't automating their releases, and they weren't working necessarily in an iterative manner. If it was a big bang release where it's changing something so fundamentally, you'd hope that they had put something in place to give them some confidence that when they go to bed at night, they're not going to wake up without jobs. And one of the things that often gets talked about outside of software engineering with this process is, does it stifle innovation? And it's obviously um, something that bothers people who see people working on small amounts of work constantly. It's repeatable, small chunks of time being used to deliver features. How do we make the big bang things happen? Um, and I, I was thinking about this, and actually we went to a talk uh, about a month ago by Dave Farley, where he was explaining about the Ranger program, uh, which was a sort of a precursor to the, to the loon man, uh, moon landings. Loon landings. Um, and they, they offered this sort of iterative approach. And I don't think anyone would argue that reaching the moon in any form is anything less than extraordinarily innovative. So they planned these missions in three blocks where they had multiple missions per block with different aims at the end of each one. And they were trying to gu guarantee themselves some learning, some scientific um, and, and technical knowledge would come back that they could then use to progress forward. And obviously, it was massively successful. Um, they, they failed for six of their nine missions, and then the last three worked perfectly, and they got very detailed photographs of the moon. And it's a really good talk by Dave. It's called Taking Back Software Engineering, and I'd definitely recommend having a watch of it. So it is possible to be innovative, and it's, it is possible to move forward in a small, piecemeal manner. And adopting these practices, this agile way of working with automated tools, is so important to us as a profession moving forward. Alongside that is this concept of rigor. Now, rigor is something that I've waffled on a lot about at work under the guise of TDD. But I think actually another story is probably the best way of, of showcasing what I mean by this. Um, I've got a friend who studied software engineering and electrical engineering at university. And he went on to work in um, discrete software for embedded systems. And he's currently working at Balfour Beatty. A little while ago, we were having a conversation about what he does, and he was explaining that they make measurement devices for tracks and overhead cables, and um, they use a six-camera array, which is working at around about 722 frames per second, which is sampling track and cable to look for anomalies and potential failure points. This, for me, was fascinating, because obviously I work in the web world, where we've got hundreds of servers trying to serve web pages to people and give them an experience very quickly. But it's not really life or death. If, if I fail to serve a web page in under five seconds to somebody, they aren't going to potentially come off the rails um, in a massive accident that's going to cause tons and tons of wreckage and, and potential loss of life. 
But clearly, his world, they can't have these multi-million pound camera arrays, trains, tracks, and overhead wires available in their office for every software engineer to be testing against. So how do they put rigor into their process to guarantee that this thing isn't going to fail when they release it later on? Coupled to this, the fact that in the UK, there is no legal requirement to be qualified as a software engineer. You can just give yourself the title. Anybody can turn up one day and say, I'm a software engineer now. No matter how junior you, you are, you, you, can, you can assume the title yourself. So it, it, it stands to reason that how do we, as people where there is no defined playing field, no agreement of what the term means in such a broad um, discipline, like how do we guarantee that we're going to be providing the quality that we need for our businesses? Moving that on, there's another question about ethics, which Anne talked about a little bit earlier. And I think I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about something that happened a couple of years ago with Volkswagen and their emissions scandal. For anyone that hasn't seen it, they're basically Volkswagen embedded software into their, into their diesel cars, which detected if it was moving while certain engine conditions were, were applied, and it would switch it into an, a low emission mode so it would pass tests. Clearly, this is a massive ethical problem. It's, it's completely against the law. Um, and it's resulted in huge public fallout for Volkswagen. They got given a $2.8 billion criminal fine. Um, they had to buy back half a million of the cars, which has eventually cost them total damages of around $25 billion. But for the engineers involved, it runs a bit deeper because they've actually started to send people to prison. So because of a decision that you, uh, or they made while they were typing code into a machine to write this software, not anybody else's decision to tell them to do it, they have ended up in prison. And it's, it's an interesting thought when you are the one in control, and I touched on it earlier, you are in control of your fingers on the keyboard. It is ultimately your responsibility to ask yourself, is this ethical? Is this correct? Am I knowingly responsible for creating something that breaks the law? Uh, and I've put a note here, cough, cough, Uber. Um, <coughs> so, moving on to a slightly more positive outlook, operating and maintaining systems. And what do we mean by this? I've borrowed this from a slide that my uh, director, Paul, put in a, a presentation a while ago. Uh, and I think it sums up perhaps a previous line of thought that we used to have, where we build it, we prove it works, we've got our tests. So clearly, it's wrong in, in production. Something's your problem. Um, but it isn't really like that anymore. And it's notably because of the effect of microservice culture. As we grow our companies and we start to break down monolithic systems into smaller pieces, the work to understand how these pieces will actually operate together and fit together falls to us, the people making them. It isn't about a team that provide a, a runtime and you just chuck the code onto it and hope for the best. You're going to start being the people that get called up at 2 in the morning when something goes wrong. So uptime and reliability are, are things that are going to jump right up your list of things to care about. So the operation is, is increasingly important. But when we talk about uptime, we'd, I think it was mentioned in Ian Massingham's talk earlier, we talked about four nines, but what does it actually mean? If you look at uptime as a, as a quantity of time per year, if you want four nines, then you're only getting 53 minutes per year of downtime. To put that another way, if your release process takes 40 minutes and you put something out that breaks production, you've used up pretty much your entire budget for the year for in that one incident. So it goes back to all of these practices I was talking about before, about small changes, iterative improvement, repeatable processes, optimizing the delivery and embracing DevOps. If you want to get to the elusive five nines, you've got five minutes. I mean, that's, that's crazy thinking. And I know that Erlang people like to talk about having nine nines of availability, but I don't think they account for stuff going wrong. Um, the other part of this is in the maintenance of it. So, a lot of times you'll hear people working on a, on a piece of, of code and they'll say, this isn't the best, this is a bit of a hack, I'll put a note in and I'll go back and fix it later. But if you go and go back and think about what an iterative process and an agile process involves, you never ever go back to it because you have a constant stream of work. It's not about this project finishes here, then we've got cleanup and then we move on to the next project. It's just constantly improving things. So you need to ensure that your system is well factored as, as, a, as a part of your day-to-day -day work. You might have to do something that is less than desirable now, but do it in a way that is going to be available, is, is open to change later. Don't, don't put in that hack that you think, oh, I just can't dare change this because it's completely um, linked to this one feature that I can't ever change because I've got no tests or I've, I've done it in a horrible way. 
So finally, let's talk about some code. Uh, I'm sure everyone in the software engineering talk wants to see it. And actually, this is the only code you'll see on my slides today, which is unusual for me. Um, some of it, again, talks about um, the, the cost of coding. 60% um, are development times, 40% are testing. It's probably in an old school world that this happens. And I'd say, actually, more of the time, it's 60% you're reading, perhaps more, 40% you're talking. Uh, and then you actually tiny, write these tiny bits of code here and there. Um, and that implies that you need to be thinking about who the end consumer is. We talk quite a lot in, as, as programmers about the readability of code, and it's more important than ever these days, especially as this is largely our documentation for the future. Um, if you're writing for people to read and you're thinking that this is going to be lacking in performance, the tools around code have improved so much that it doesn't really matter anymore. For example, JavaScript, it's idiomatic to write stuff in a way that is readable because V8 knows now, and other runtimes know, that that is the way that people would prefer to see code, and they can optimize that in the JIT. Uh, other, other tools, they have multiple pass compilers that can take things from a much more human readable format and put it into machine code that is extremely well optimized too. Um, I was going to talk about the hunt for the full stack engineer, but I think I'm going to run a bit, a bit short on time, so I'm just going to skip on to this. All of this together means that we need to be thinking about how our teams are structured, because clearly this is such a broad topic, you cannot hope to have all of this yourself. You can't, you can't be an expert in all these domains. Um, so the size of the teams that you work in becomes increasingly important, because you need to have the shared knowledge and expertise amongst all of you. Uh, the two pizza rule from, from before is quite an interesting one. And we employ this at Skybet where our teams are limited to around about eight or nine people at a maximum. And it's really effective. You can't hope to know everything, but you can rely on your colleagues. And it isn't about you just siloing up your knowledge. It is about sharing it widely in that team and making sure that if you're an expert in UI, you're sharing that with someone who might be more of an expert in ops. And you, as a group, can progress forward much more effectively. Being quantifiable and measurable, like software is immensely measurable. We have so many tools available to us to make sure that we are working efficiently. We've got our JIRA stats that we can produce every month. We've got um, lots of measurements in our ops and monitoring. But also, we've got the ability to put in stuff that tells us how our customers are using our products, which is vitally important. If you aren't reviewing that regularly as an engineer, then that is something you need to start looking at a bit more seriously, because it tells you how people are enjoying and how people are using what you've built and giving you that vital feedback. So just summing up briefly, as a software engineer, it's OK to take your time because there is an awful lot to learn. And sometimes that next breakthrough for you will start in the past. Seek and pass on that knowledge and value the experience of people who have been doing this longer than you. But also, don't be in a hurry to change away from being in an engineering role for the sake of progression. We should be finding other ways to reward people who are wanting to stay as engineers because they are so valuable to us in our ecosystem. Be thorough and precise when you're coding. Consider the role of test-driven development and other things that allow you to show demonstrably that you're working in a correct and rigorous way. You want to know that you are going to be able to prove something before you put it into a runtime environment, because you don't always have access to the same environment in test as you do in live. You, are, and only you, are responsible for your output. And so you need to always consider the ethics of what you're doing and how that might play out in terms of the software that will come out of your fingers and into the computer. And of course, all the way through, try and document this. It doesn't mean that you have to have massive documents of, of requirements, of things that you've done over time. Just take the time to, to note your decisions and put down any kind of context that would be important for a colleague in six or 12 months or three years or whatever to come back to and they can understand. Because times might have changed. You might have the ab ability now to do something that you previously couldn't, but without that context, you have lost the knowledge and you are unable to build for the future. And then finally, I think, yeah, nearly finally, build small cross-functional teams and support small single-purpose units of, of work. Because the smaller your systems, the more you can reason about it, the less likelihood of you not being able to hold all the context in your head, and you can work seamlessly to produce something that is going to work correctly and work efficiently. And lastly, de deliver your working code as frequently as possible. Embrace DevOps. Get stuff into production as quickly as you can, and make sure that your, work, your code is working at all times. Never get in a broken state, and always keep yourself in a, in a good, factored code base. That's me. Thank you very much.